Hey, it's your boy D Neil back with another reaction video, guys. Here we are with Do You Believe in Miracles? The story of the 1980 U.S. hockey team. What you guys asked me to react to. So here we are. Before we dive in, make sure you subscribe to the channel, ring notification bell, give the video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. You guys got a favorite video suggestion, you can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. We are going to cut this into four different parts. So let's start part one. It was more than a hockey game. Mm. It was us against them. It was freedom versus communism. Nobody gave us a hope in Halloween. It. it was a sliver of the Cold War played out on a sheet of ice. Here you have a bunch of fresh faced college kids taking Crazy. on the big bad Soviet bear. God dang! In the United States in the Olympics. The confluence of events was so extraordinary, it can never happen again. Nobody paid attention to what Americans said in the world anymore. Our hostages had been taken, and we couldn't get them back. Wow. The Red Army went into Afghanistan. We couldn't get them out. It might have been the all-time low point for American public self-esteem. Who knew wow. that these kids would become the vehicle for making people feel excited and proud again to wave a flag? It was America. That's crazy. David slew Goliath. It was the greatest sports moment of the 20th century. See, I feel like I didn't know about, like, because obviously I wasn't born yet, but like, I didn't know that American morale, like, was so low ever since I've been born. I feel like it's been such, like, a prideful country, uh, you know, a uh, very patriotic country. Uh, everybody believing that we're the greatest. And so the fact that it's like, uh, it seemed like morale in America and just was, was this low. That's crazy, uh, and the fact that this USA hockey team was a big part of making people proud again. America. For many, it is a word that conjures up images of a land of miracles where anything is possible. But that's not how it was in much of the 1970s. Hmm. when a darkness seemed to hang over the nation. It was Kent State and final defeat in Vietnam. There was Watergate and Three Mile Island. There were long lines at the gas station, Dang. exorbitant interest rates at the bank, and at the end of the decade, an overwhelming image signifying just how powerless we'd become. No one could wow. know that it would be, of all things, a hockey game played by 20 American kids filled with optimism and determination that would rejuvenate the American spirit and become a symbol of national pride. No one could know how important one game could possibly be to a nation that seemed to be losing its way. Certainly not in 1979 when a weary wow. America heard from its embattled leader who told us we were a nation in crisis. Wow. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. President Carter was seen as a, an expression of the American self-doubt and lack of self-confidence of mm. the mid-70s. Our public support was eroding rapidly. You could feel it when you're out with people, when you're giving speeches, when you're shaking hands. America, I think, had begun to wonder whether we'd lost our edge. At the end of the 70s, American amateur hockey was suffering the same malaise as the nation itself. Mm. In the 20 years since winning the gold medal at the 1960 Olympics, 
American teams had become increasingly unable to compete with the dominant wow. Europeans, especially the Soviet Union, whose players were amateurs in name only. The Americans. That's crazy. I feel like why? Because I feel like it was in basketball too uh, until they started letting the professionals play. Like, why? I, I don't know. Why were you only a professional if you played like pro in America, but in other countries in Europe and all that, like you could play professional, you could have grown men, but they were still considered amateurs when it came to the Olympics. I'm very intrigued to know about that one. We're always amateurs, college kids, some of them, or recent graduates who still played the game, but certainly not at the, the Russian level. There was no way that they could be competitive. And the feeling going into 1980 was they really haven't got much of a chance, even though it's here in Lake Placid. The goal was to avoid being embarrassed at home. So in July of 1979, the best amateur players in the country were invited to try out for the 1980 Olympic team. They invited mm -hmm. us all to Colorado Springs and they divided us up into four teams. Basically, Eastern guys, Michigan guys, <laughs> Minnesota guys, and an at-large team. Over the course of 10 days in Colorado Springs, those four teams played a round robin. It was a nerve-wracking oh. situation. It was a, a pressure-packed situation. And as that tournament went on, it was being evaluated by Herb Brooks. Mike, catch up, Mike. Herb Brooks never went to charm school. Get it off, get it off, quick. If he had, he, he would have flunked out. How would you call it? <laughs> it was abrasive. There's two teams playing at St. Stan. Intense. He was also the best college hockey coach in the country. People were a little afraid of him. He'd always been considered kind of an outsider, had his own way of thinking, his own way of doing things. And he had a history with the Olympic team. As a University of Minnesota player, Brooks thought he had made the team in 1960. He was even in the team picture. But at the last minute, coach Jack Riley added a new player to the roster. Oh, Someone wow. To go. The someone wow. was Herb Brooks, cut just one day before the team left for the games. That's crazy. Back home in Minnesota, Brooks watched with his father as his old teammates beat Czechoslovakia and won America's first gold medal in ice hockey. When we that, that had to literally be so painful. I can't to be cut the day before, the day before you go out and play and then see your team win, and then see that team go on and win a goal, knowing that you were that close to being a part of it. Oh my God. With Doris as well. Looks like Coach Riley cut the right guy, didn't he? So, wow. true story, and I, you know, it sort of hit me right between the eyes. That left unfinished business in Herb Brooks' life. He had something to prove. He was on a mission. A mission to shake American hockey out of its slumber. First, Brooks had to trim the roster from 80 to 26. Dang. So he began by keeping the players he knew best, ones who had helped him win three NCAA championships God in the dang. University of Minnesota in the 70s. Jeez. They included Mike Ramsey and Bill Baker, Neil Broughton and Rob McClanahan, Eric Strobel and Buzz Schneider. But Brooks knew he couldn't be provincial. Herb wanted to make sure that it didn't look like a Minnesota team because he was from Minnesota. He wanted to make sure <laughs> there was a good balance. So Brooks looked eastward to another college hockey powerhouse, Boston University, mm. where he got Jack O'Callaghan, a defenseman with an attitude, and Michael Ruzioni, whose name in Italian means eruption, perfectly fitting his personality. <laughs> to fill the most important role, Brooks picked 22-year-old Jim Craig, who've been playing goaltender since he began skating on the frozen ponds of New England. I started to play goal because I didn't know the rules. And I figured, you know, that's <laughs> hard. He's just supposed to keep that puck out of the net. <laughs> out of the net, as well as any amateur goaltender around, but spent his college years playing with a broken heart, following the death of his mother, Margaret, from cancer. Wow. His father, Donald, took the loss extremely hard. I think when my mother passed away, a piece of my father left he was so lost. He was a shell of himself. I, I think death and the tragedy of that brought us really, really close together. I spent a lot of time with Jimmy. I talked to Jimmy an awful lot. Jimmy was the guy in my mind that I thought we had to put the saddle on. Brooks filled out the team with gritty players like Mark Johnson from the University of Wisconsin, mm. John Harrington and Mark Pavlich from Minnesota Duluth. 
Kenny Morrow from Bowling Green, and tapped others, mostly from colleges in the upper Midwest. They were tough and fast and disciplined, but compared to the world's best, the players who were called amateurs, but in reality played hockey for a living, the Americans were just a bunch of kids, not mm. feared and not respected. We were by far the youngest, most inexperienced team when it came <laughs> to the Olympic Games. We were just college kids playing flat out professional, older, stronger, better, you know, athletes. So it was That's a real crazy. task. Behind the iron Yeah, I, I, I still don't understand that. Somebody got to explain that to me. I don't get it. Another intense coach was preparing his team for Lake Placid. Hmm. But Viktor Tikhonov didn't have any of her Brooks's problems. The Soviets were the best hockey team in the world, and everybody Jeez. knew it. So Tikhonov's goal was simple, to return home to Moscow with his nation's fifth straight Olympic hockey gold medal. God! Five, his own players despised straight. him meant nothing. I would say he was a fanatic, thinking of hockey 24 hours per day. He wanted that the Soviet Union or Russia will be number one everywhere and anywhere. And he wanted that every player who plays for him will think the same way. The players hated mm. him big time. <laughs> the life was intense, practically without family, children or hobbies. It was Dang. only work. Vladislav Tretiak grew up just outside of Moscow and became immersed in the Soviet sports machine at a young age. He developed into perhaps the greatest goaltender to ever play and starred on the Soviet national team for over 15 years. Dang! We lived in camps for nine months out of the year. We trained, studied theory and practiced three times a day. It was a difficult and harsh life. I saw my wife and children rarely. But the thing is, I loved hockey very much. I thought that's the way it should be, and I was ready to sacrifice and put discipline ahead of everything in order to be first and for my team to win. Tretiak and his teammates were first, year after year. Their lives and careers were controlled by the Soviet government, because technically, they were soldiers in the Red Army. But Why? I went from a private to lieutenant colonel, but didn't do any army stuff. For the most part, we were fully devoted to hockey. By 1980, Boris Mikhailov was already a 10-year veteran of the Soviet national team and the most recognizable face in international hockey. God! So they was in the army, but they wasn't in the army. They were in the army by name only. But they were really professional hockey players. Sport was tied with politics, and any victory had big political undertones. Especially during the Olympic Games, when the general secretary and everybody else was worried about how we would represent our country. Our task was only to place first. Mikhailov and his teammates represented the Soviet Union by demolishing just about anyone who got in their way. They were government-sponsored magicians on ice who had been dominating international hockey since the darkest days of the Cold War. It was a That's dynasty, crazy. definitely, for 10, 20, 30 years. Their That's main crazy. goal was to win in every game, every period, every shift. And it was one regular season when they won 43 out of 44 games. My 64, God. 68, 72, 76, right up until 1980, the Soviets were unbeatable in the Olympics. They played hockey the way we played basketball with the same mm. kind of control, okay. play, the same kind of intricate offensive patterns, and of course the presence and goal of Tretiak, how could you beat him? Back in the US, Herb Brooks had been contemplating that same question for years. Mm. They could execute at such a high level of speed, skating, passing, shooting, thinking. I tried to develop a team that would throw their game right back at him. But mm. first, Brooks would have to get his players to start thinking as a team, which wouldn't be easy. 
The rivalry between the University of Minnesota and Boston University was one of the fiercest in all of college hockey, and regional tensions between many of the new teammates ran high. As much as I was a Boston hockey player and I had pride in my roots as a Boston hockey player, I had an enemy, and my enemy was the University of Minnesota. There was a <laughs> between the, the guys from out east and the guys from out west. You know, they'd come in with their fancy clothes and not <laughs> trash, and, and there's us guys, you know, we're just kind of, you know, got, a little bit different outlook on everything. The Boston guys, you know, we thought we were pretty savvy and, you know, there were guys that didn't lock their doors or left their wallets out in plain sight. We thought, Ooh. you know, these guys are a bunch of hicks from the cow pastures. I wanted to blur the, the boundaries of our country, build a we and an us and ourselves as opposed mm. to an I, me, myself. Our spirit was going to be a big asset and you can't have that type of thing if you have pockets of individuals and that there's not those team building exercises throughout the year. Starting in August of 79, Brooks began employing his main team building exercise, beginning a rugged six month pre Olympic training program with a strategy. To bond them as a team, his players needed one common enemy him. Mm. Herb always liked that where it would. That's smart. That's smart, Herb. I like it. I like it. Him. He was the bad guy. He liked being in that bad guy role. I remember when he told us, I'll be a coach, but I won't be a friend. And I'm like, wow, this is going to be a long year. Herbie came <laughs> around like manhole covers. He quoted in the paper that I had a million dollar set of legs and a 10 cent fart for a brain. He can give you that glare and that look, and it's like, oh my <clears> god, what did I do wrong now? I can honestly say that uh, there was no sense of regionalism on that team. There was a sense of Herbieism. And if Herbieism had a language, it could be found in a tiny notebook the players secretly kept. <laughs> At this moment, their coach began to sound like a cross between Yogi Berra and Casey Stengel. The players called his strange motivational sayings, Brooksisms. <laughs> Brooksisms. Brooksisms on our team. You don't have enough talent to win on talent alone. There's a fine mm. line between guts and brains. You look like a monkey screwing <laughs> a football, whatever that is, <laughs> I'm not sure. Rams are playing, you're playing worse and worse every day, and right now you're playing like it's next week. Carrington, you're playing worse <laughs> and worse. <laughs> you're playing worse and worse every day, and right now you're looking like it's next week. <laughs> you're playing worse and worse every day, and right now you're playing like it's next week. Carrington, you're playing worse every day, and right now you're playing like the middle of next month. First off, you suck. You know, you're getting worse every day, and today you're playing like next month. I mean, that was a, that was a tip work, but he was right. And his strategy was working. Herb Brooks was transforming them into a team. Our Olympic team got very tight with the idea that it was us versus him. And we were <laughs> as a group trying to prove to him that we're good enough to play. It was Herbie bashing from day one until the final day of the Olympics. It, it really made them a unit. As September arrived, Dang, that's smart. ...against future Olympic competition. So Brooks took the team to Europe for a series of exhibition games. The Americans started out strong, winning six of their first eight. But Brooks kept pressing. Before a game against Norway, a team they would have to face at the Olympics, he issued a challenge. I said, guys, we're going to have to play the Norwegians in qualifications. So we do it tonight. We send a message right now. Ooh. But playing flat and uninspired hockey, the U.S. could only muster a 3-3 tie, and Brooks was furious. As we went to get off the ice, Herbie ran from the bench down to the gate and said, stay out on the ice. Steam's coming out of his ears. He's so hot that we had tied Norway, which was the weakest team we had played over there. If that's all we can do is tie the Norway national team 3-3, and you think you're going to go to the Olympics and be successful, you got another guest coming. He's standing there with his suit on, and he makes us all get behind the net and on the goal line, and he starts blowing his whistle. And we did what are called Herbies, which are blue line back, red line back, far blue line back, all the way down and back. Two or three of those would be tiring. Blue line back, red line back, blue line back, down and back. 10 or 12 of them would be excessive. <laughs> and we did them for about 45 minutes to an God hour. God dang! And turned the lights off on us, and we still skated in the dark. In the dark, he's screaming at us. Booming voice around this empty arena. It was pretty intense. The message went out right then. They're not going to play the game like that and disgrace their abilities or our collective efforts. No one. Harry wasn't playing no games with you. But that's all we got for this part, guys. Uh, I'm excited to continue watching. 
you guys got a favorite video suggestion, you can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. Subscribe to the channel, ring notification bell, give the video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. It's your boy Danielle. Out.